Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to Cover Story by New Books Network, a podcast where we talk about people who write, edit, and publish long-form journalism. My name is Aga Popenda, and I'm your host. And today we're talking with British writer Ian Leslie, an author of long-form journalism, and three books uh, on very controversial subjects, Born Liars, About the Power of Lying, uh, curious about human curiosity, and most recently, very fresh, uh, conflicted about the uh, usefulness of conflict, I guess. Uh, Ian regularly appears in The Guardian, The New Statesman, The Economist. Um, how else would you uh, describe yourself? What am I missing? I think that's a, a fair summary. Yeah, I, I, I write books about uh, human behaviour, I, I suppose I take an aspect of human behavior that I think is that we're looking at the wrong way. Um, and, and I try and, and, and make people see it afresh. Um, and I do that by, by talking to experts from various different disciplines and, and kind of bring together insight from lots of different places. Um, and yeah, so, so a book about lying, as you say, a book about curiosity. And this one is about how to, how to disagree better. I just think we're, we're uh, we're not very good at disagreement and conflict, and uh, generally, and we need to get better at it. So this is my little contribution to that effort. Right, and we will uh, talk about it in depth. I just also would like to point out that you also co-hosted a podcast um, titled "Polarized." Um, so you're not new to podcasting, and I was wondering about this uh, formula of a uh, podcast. I was wondering if this, if, if a podcast is a good platform to practice conflict in a safe environment, because, you know, there's always this exchange. What do you think? <laughs> yes. I mean, I, I do think it's a better place to have uh, argument and disagreement than um, t- Twitter or, or, or Facebook, you know, because you... You're not just consuming the other person's words; you're actually hearing their voice, and and the, and you can get a lot of information from the way that somebody says something that, that you can't get. Or it's a lot more difficult to get when you're just reading letters in in, in a text box. Um, so I I think that's it's interesting. I do think podcasts is, is a space where people can discuss these content contentious issues without getting into stupid fights. Hopefully. Yeah. So the piece we are talking about is uh, how to have better arguments online that's just appeared in The Guardian. Um, What is the relation of this piece uh, to the whole book? Uh, Can we think about it as a first chapter, a summary, some uh, post-book thoughts? Um, Yeah. It's it's a pretty, it's a good kind of flavor of the book as as a whole, I would say. Um, And it... It's a. It's really a summary of the opening argument that I make in the book, which is why we need to talk about disagreement at all. Like, why? Why are we so? Why, why am I arguing that we are so bad at it? Why do we need to improve at it? Why hasn't the internet made us, you know, more more harmonious and more peace, peaceful? Um, and then I get into some of the of the advice in the book that I that I get from experts, like people who work in interrogation or hostage negotiation, people who have very tough conflict-driven conversations, um, they have great insight to offer in, into how to handle these difficult disagreements. So I get into some of that as well. So it's a pretty good cross-section of the book. The only thing about it is that the headline is how to have better arguments online, I think, or something like that. Um, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. it's only partly about online. And in fact, the book as a whole I don't spend that much time talking about online in, in environments. Um, it's it's about all kinds of, of disagreement and face to face as much as uh, anything else. So, do you remember when you knew the moment when you realized that you will write a book about conflict and why? I don't think there was a particular eureka moment, but I, I started thinking about it just because. Uh, perhaps I was spending too much time on Twitter, actually. But I, I, I was just seeing a lot of really terrible arguments, a lot of um, animosity and anger and outrage, and people who kind of 
people pretending to disagree and argue, but actually not really, just just abusing each other. And you see that not just on social media, but you see it in in the political realm, you know, uh, as well. And I, so, so my first thought was, okay, um, how, how can we argue and so on w- without falling out, right? Maybe, maybe that's what I, I want to write about because I do, I do think it's incredibly important. But as I looked into it, and the more I thought about it, the more I thought actually, the problem, the problem is almost the opposite. Most people are not getting into toxic arguments all the time. It just it seems like that if you, if you spend a lot of time on social media, but most people in your daily life are, are 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 not, and in fact the biggest problem is that we avoid open disagreement and open conflict, and that we are as as, as societies I think we are already fairly uncomfortable with it, and we, we're getting increasingly uncomfortable <laughs> um, with it, and and um, we need to address that because there are huge benefits of good, open, constructive disagreement. Um, and, and when you kind of turn away from it because it's uncomfortable or stressful, um, I, I think there's a huge downside to that. Um, so the book is really saying, you know, we need to have more arguments, more disagreements, more open conflict, but we need to do it intelligently and constructively. So so here's here's how. But at the same time, if I understand it correctly, you advocate on the behalf of being moderate, correct? Uh, that's something that I saw on your Twitter. Oh, right. <laughs> I have a token. Recently. Yeah. I was just wondering if, uh, um, uh, what's the relation of like, uh, you know, uh, seeking moderation uh, would be more like seeking compromise. Or maybe are we talking here, uh, for example, in our politics about, um, you know, steady small conflict kind of small explosions uh but no revolution you know what i mean i just wonder um uh what's the balance uh between conflict for example in politics and uh and moderating yourself and not going to extremes yeah i i this is a really good question and a and a a, a sort of deep question i um i'm not arguing that everybody should be moderate and 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 um you know nice to each other all the time um and that we or, or that we should be super kind of cool coolly rational all the time um i think uh we we should argue with our heart as well as our head right we should, we should argue mm-hmm. passionately and when we should kind of throw ourselves into 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 debate and and, and disagreement um so, and sometimes we should be immoderate, right? We shouldn't always be um, moderate. But I guess what I'm saying is, unless you have some kind of control over that, and you, uh, you know, unless you give some thought to to what you're doing to the other person um, in, in in this debate or disagreement, you just end up with no disagreement because the other person leaves the room, mm-hmm. you know, metaphorically or or, or literally. You, you you want to have a passionate disagreement, but you also want to keep the other person engaged, you know, in in the conversation. Otherwise, you're just not having the, the, the disagreement. Um, now, that's not always possible. Sometimes you're arguing with people who are just not worth your time, right? Um, and and it might take you a while to figure that out. Um, but on the whole, the, the the book is making a case for saying, actually, you know. You, you could have much more productive, much more interesting disagreements with people, with your opponents, whether they're your opponents politically or just you know on a particular issue, say at work, um, if you if you follow some of these basic guidelines. And and yeah, I I, I don't I don't think it all has to be moderate or, or or rational. I actually, you know, we think a lot better when we are emotional. You know, it's not like there's mm-hmm. a we're, we're either we're emotional or, or we're, we're we're intelligent. Like the 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 more in, the more kind of emotional, more your heart is in something, the more you apply your intelligence to it. So um, uh, I think that is a bit of a false dichotomy. Okay, uh, and you're bringing in the article uh, an example of AOC, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, our young American politician here, who's. Uh, uh, I was wondering, uh, you describe her little tactic uh, that she uses with her interlocutors is pretty much uh, about uh, using empathy. Um, and I was wondering, 
uh, is she good in conflict? Um, and also, um, because, you know, she's not a moderate person. And also many people, don't get me wrong, I absolutely adore her, but many people see her as a very conflicting person, right? Yeah. 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 Um, so so I, I quote um, from her, there's a great talk she gives and um and and there's a there's a great passage in it where where she talks about what she learned from community organizing how to how to kind of bring people around to your side one of the things she says is um you give people the golden gate of retreat i think she calls it what she means is allow the other person you know if you're in an argument show them a way out that enables them to look good right Your, your job is not to kind of crush them and show them how wrong they are to humiliate them which which frankly is how a lot of these arguments play out right um your your, your job is to help them find a way to agree with you that doesn't humiliate them that actually makes them feel pretty good about themselves right that's quite a skillful kind of art and i thought it was a really good point um as to her as a politician i i don't know that's that's a separate kind of question Mm -hmm. um i i my my concern about her or, or like just you know, not her kind of brand of politics um, is that it, it it actually involves a lot of talking to their own side. Um, I, I and I what I worry about is that they they have slightly given up on trying to engage with people with whom they disagree. Um, mm-hmm. So um, I I I think that you know maybe she could take a little bit of her own her own advice but it certainly was good advice yeah um so the most interesting and happy thought uh, in the article was the one that uh, that conflict um, uh, in internet uh, on social media doesn't necessarily uh divides us and it's actually bursting bubbles and that's kind of something uh uh well it's a happy uh Thought. Can you uh, can you uh, tell us more about it? Because that's not necessarily something that uh, is obvious, right? We feel more and more divided. But you say that uh, explorations online can actually will eventually bring us together, and that uh, internet users uh, encounter more conflict and more different opinions. Yes, I mean I'm not that bullish about, <laughs> not that optimistic about social media, but um, in ter- in this context anyway. Um, but um, I I do think that the, sometimes the way we talk about it is slightly the wrong way round. Um, so so it's we talk about the filter bubble, and you know it's this idea that we only ever hear from people that we that we already agree with that, that already think like, like us. Um, and, and that, that can be a problem, but, but actually the reason there's so much kind of toxic toxicity and, and acrimony out there on social media is that actually we're confronted with way more disagreeable opinions than ever before in, in history. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. You know, I grew up in a, in a filter bubble in my house. We watched the BBC news and we bought my parents bought the same newspaper every day um and that was it you know um mm. uh, now that is a that that is a filter bubble um these days you you get on the internet and 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 you know within 30 seconds you see a hundred things that you disagree with and 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 a lot of those opinions and uh, and, and information are framed as you know, they're, they're outrageous. They're sort of emotionally charged. They're, they're very kind of like angry or upsetting. Um, you don't come across angering, upsetting things on a daily basis. And someone did a study of this, and you know, found this to be empirically true. That you know, on a day to day basis, we don't very often come across things that make us go, "Oh, that's horrible. That's outrageous. That's really kind of got me angry." Um, whereas online, it happens a lot so there's this kind of parade of, of injustices and and atrocities um and and that kind of uh you know inevitably leads to 
this sort of slightly futile war of war of outrage where everybody's getting you know annoyed with each other all, all the time um so it's a, just an example of because i don't think it's just about social media as I, as i say but but it's an example of how the modern world presents us with a lot more disagree disagreeable opinions than we've been used to historically um but we haven't been trained or prepared for how to deal with with confronting disagreeable opinions um and and you know i think we're just not really remotely prepared for for what's happening okay so if if uh if we were writing a history of conflict are we better or worse as humanity in conflict or is it too early to tell well in the type the type of conflict i'm talking about which is you know argument rather than military conflict or fighting which is kind of mm-hmm. what happens when arguments just stop you know when we yeah. give up um i would say that we are uh it's a relatively n- new development that that we do it so much um it's it's for, for most of our existence as a as a as a species of civilizations we've lived effectively you know we've lived in filter bubbles you know we've we've lived in pretty settled tribes and then uh, uh, and, and communities where even when there were things that you were disagreeing about you know in terms of how you run the the, the city um there is a huge host of things on which you all agree you agree on which god or gods you're worshiping you know um you agree on on the hierarchy the basic hierarchy of, of of the society that that you're in um and obviously i'm talking in huge kind of historical broad sweeps here but what you're seeing is a collapse of of those things uh, particularly you know over the last sort of two or three hundred years and then it's kind of accelerated um in the last century and then accelerated again as uh, with the rise of, of the internet you're seeing a gr- much greater diversity of opinions in every situation you're seeing a far greater diversity of values and 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 r- religious and political um it backgrounds and ethos is uh, involved in every conversation everybody has the right to to speak right we, we you know in in theory anyway we we live in a much more democratic egalitarian society than than we did than we ever have um and so everybody's kind of talking back to each other all the time now that's good right because we that i love that most of us love that we we love the fact that this is a more Uh, a society where people don't know their place you know um where women are much more likely to 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 speak up and and have a voice than they were 100 years ago or even 50 years ago um but inevitably it does mean that we are uh, disagreeing more um because everybody's expected to speak their mind and and when you do that you find out how much people actually disagree with you all those people you kind of assumed agreed with you turns out they do not and the number of things on which we all agree in inverted commas uh is shrinking very fast um but as i say uh, as i said earlier the the we haven't compensated for that by thinking okay well we need to get really good at disagreement we don't even think about it like that. we don't think of it as a skill that we need to to improve at mm-hmm. um so we're just kind of crashing into this new world not really prepared for it um and i think it's just kind of freaking us all out a bit yeah <laughs> um and ian you actually started uh just to change the subject a bit uh in advertising how you ended up uh becoming a writer uh your journey oh um yeah i my first career was in advertising uh and advertising is uh tremendously uh interesting and fun um it's actually a great thing to do in your 20s uh and your 30s but i kind of got to and i worked you know it gets you around the world I worked in, in 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 new york and london um and and flew around and also you know it was it's a really kind of great great thing great career i think um but uh, fundamentally it's it, i didn't find it that satisfying um and at some point in my kind of mid to late 30s i started thinking well 
what else is there? I'm not sure I want to be doing this this interesting but fundamentally quite silly job, <laughs> you know, for the rest of my life. Um, I, I do really enjoy writing and I love thinking about ideas. Um, mm-hmm. So maybe I can maybe I can do that. So so I went part time. I resigned from my job and started to freelance so that I could do, you know, spend fewer hours in advertising and just gave myself more time and space to to write. Um, and um, yeah. really inspired by that whole kind of genre of smart thinking or smart ideas books that that opened up in the, really in the wake of Malcolm Gladwell's uh, first books. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I, I sort of started writing in, in that space and, and doing some journalism as well. Um, and then, yeah, here, here we are. Um, a few books later, um, and this is kind of actually I still do work in in advertising and, and communications. I'm still a strategist, um, but uh, the, at the heart of of my my of what I do is is writing. Yeah. Um, so this is a podcast about long form journalism, and I was um, uh, wondering. Um, uh, about conflict in journalism, some of it uh, you uh, uh, talked about an experience, the meaning Twitter. But I think, uh, but what do you think in general about um, how we conduct ourselves uh, uh, in the journalism these days? Uh, could we how could we navigate or how can we navigate conflict better as journalists? Well, um, th- there's a kind of debate going on in journalism at the moment, which is, uh, should we be more openly kind of one uh, uh, c- committed to social justice or things that we we, we believe in, uh, and should we drop the uh, this kind of facade of neutrality where where we are pretend to be even handed about issues where there's only w- really one legitimate side of the argument. Uh, right, you're familiar, yeah. familiar with this kind of debate, right? Very much so, yeah. very much so. Um, <laughs> and my view is very much that we need to uh, retain um, objectivity of, of, of a kind. I'm not sure objectivity is the right word, actually, but I, I think it's more to do with curiosity. Um, actually, you know, going back to the theme of my last book, which is connected to this one. Um, you know, which which is you you might think that the, that other person has this view which you think is completely I- illegitimate, or, or this group of people you you're kind of ruling out of of uh, the sphere of le- legitimate debate. But uh, as a journalist, your job is to understand them, um, mm-hmm. and your job is to be is to be interested in how they come to how they came to to think like that, and. To be interested and to be genuinely curious about someone does actually involve dropping a little bit of your judgmentalism. Um, uh, and, you know, it's interesting because it does relate to some of the some of the people I talked to for this book, as I say, were, are people who work uh, in interrogation um, and hostage negotiation. And to do their job properly, they have to drop their their judgmentalism, right? Um, expert, really good interrogators. There's lots of bad interrogators, but the really good ones, the really effective ones, um, do not walk into the room and say, "Right, you terrible person, you, you need to tell me exactly what you know, or we're going to throw the book at you, or whatever we go, we, we, we're going to do." Because they know mm-hmm. that doesn't work. It just effectively kind of ends the conversation or, you know, closes off any possibility of conversation because the other person just sort of closes down and, 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 and digs in. What they do is th- they walk into the room and they say something like, uh, look, um, you don't have to talk uh, if, if you don't want to. It's your legal right not to talk. Um, you can leave the room now, right, if, if you want to. Uh, but I would, I just really would like to hear your story because I'm just interested in, in how you ended up here. What you know, what what happened? And 
you know, these hardened terrorists who have been trained in 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 camps for for, for years to exactly for this kind of situation just sort of break down and and gush and and tell them uh their story and 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 with it a lot of uh, val- valuable information all the things they weren't supposed to say um it's it, it's people really want to 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 be heard and they want to want to tell their story and of course the interrogator then gets what he or she wants but the point about it is that the interrogator has to do this genuinely, right? If they walk in there thinking, I'm going to trick this person in, into telling me their story, the, 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 the suspect can tell, right? These are, you know, often quite smart people, um, certainly mm-hmm. socially intelligent people. They can tell when you're, when you're trying to trick them. So you have to walk in there and you have to be genuinely curious. So why is this person, why is this terrible person who, may, by the way, may have just tried to, in, you know, kill or may have killed or injured colleagues of mine, you have to put your your judgment aside and say, and say well, I'm, I'm just going to be interested in this person. Now, hmm. I, I think if if mm-hmm. interrogators of terrorists can do that, <laughs> then then journalists from from the New York Times or or where whatever can surely put their judgmentalism aside and 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 talk to people who they think are you know racist or or, or misogynist or whatever and get interested in them as as human beings. Um, Because you're going to understand them uh, a lot better and you're also going to get a lot better information. Um, So I I think there's uh, a principle, which is you're not activists, you're journalists, right? Your job is to uncover reality. It's not to to shape reality to whatever ends. Because, by the way, you might be wrong. You know, you, you... that for me, mm-hmm. the humility is just a key part of this. You might not be seeing the world and you know perfectly correctly. Maybe you can learn even from uh, you, your your enemies. Um, and also, you know, you're just going to get a much richer picture of of reality if if you are able to get information even from people that that, that you dislike or, or uh, instinctively dismiss. Um, so yeah, that, that that's my kind of view of of that of that debate. Mm-hmm. Based on your observation, when people uh, seek a conflict, uh, do they do it typically because uh, for the sake of it or because they feel passionately about it? Uh, uh, Let's say online, uh, what is a bigger motivator? Uh, Do we have people that really like to argue or just people that feel very passionately about things? Um, well, let's, maybe we can just put uh, online aside for a minute because I, I think this, this mm-hmm. general principles extend uh, uh, on or offline. Um, often what, what what you find when, when somebody is being very kind of uh, aggressive or, or hostile it is there's some uh, – they, they feel – slighted or or, or or insecure uh they feel like they have to be on on the defensive and often that means going on the offensive um sometimes people are just horrible because they think that's the way on social media you know there's a big incentive to just win uh attention and and retweets and likes and one of the ways you can do that is be by being vile to to to, to people right so there's a big kind mm-hmm. of incentive problem with with social media in particular um but let's put that to one side I, I think there's a good question is, you know, why when I'm in a disagreement uh, and the other person is being, I think, quite unpleasant or uh, maybe kind of a little bit crazy or irrational, you know, what, what what's going on here? And often what's going on here, not always, but often that person actually feels like they are not getting the respect or esteem, or even affection that that, that they need and, and deserve. Right. So this could be as, mm-hmm. as true of a disagreement you're having with your mother, you know, or your 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 sister, um, as it is of somebody uh, when you're disagreeing with your boss at work, um, or, or 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 a political debate or anything. Right. Why is this person being really kind of difficult to to handle? Well, it's often because they think that you are trying to dominate them in 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 some way even politely even subtly um and they push back so a 
big kind of reason that the disagreements go wrong is that somebody is kind of pushing a little bit too hard on the on a door. Let's go back to the what I was talking about interrogators. You know, interrogators mm-hmm. they don't even say you know the good ones do not even say politely. Please, you need to tell me what you need. You need to tell me what you know. This is going to go a lot better if you just tell me this 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 information. They they very rarely say even do that um, because. When you push like that, what what happens is you get pressure coming back the other way, right? The psychologists call it reactance, or sometimes call hmm. it the backfire effect, right? You try and persuade someone to 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 agree with you or to come around to your point of view or to do something. It's kind of natural, perverse human tendency to say, "Hey, back off," um, and and that can manifest itself as as hostility and and, and aggression or just sullenness and so on. Um, so your job is not to kind of push them into the position that you want them. It, it, it's to it's to find a way of lowering their defenses, lowering the pressure on them, so that they can actually they actually feel good about being a little bit more free and thoughtful and, and uh, flexible in, in in their position. Um, and often that means you know that can mean uh, showing them that you respect them. Like sometimes you know just explicitly saying, look, I I, I think. I really respect your what you've done, or and what you and your position here, or I really agree with you on this, but I, I have a question about this. You know, you're looking mm-hmm. for ways to make them just feel a little bit more secure in in the exchange, so that they can be a little bit more flexible in in the disagreement. Okay, but what if you deal with an actual bully, with someone pretty aggressive who is uh, trying to dominate you and not in a polite way, okay? So, uh, meaning, uh, do we always, uh, uh, you know, you know, your article talks about giving people the face, correct? Uh, I'm sorry, I probably... Yeah, no, that, I mean, uh, that's basically what I was talking about. So, so, you know, everybody has a face that they want to project in, yeah. in, a, in a conversation, especially if it's if there are lots of people in the room or if in you know online there can be many people in the room um and the this skillful kind of disagreeer actually gives some thought to how can i make the other person look good how can i do the face work yeah. on their behalf right this is you know a bit like what aoc was 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 talking about um how can i how can i allow them to be more flexible in their position and maybe agree with me a little bit more um, whilst looking good in front of the people that they want to look good in in, in front of, right? That's a real. There's a real art to to that. Um, yeah. Now, your you, your your prior question was, you know, what if they're just horrible? Yeah, I mean, some people are. You, you walk away. I mean, I, I, there's no. I my my. I'm not saying that everybody can be dealt with like this. No, everybody can be engaged with. Sometimes you're just dealing with with terrible people <laughs> or people who are just in a terrible. Um, mood and 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 just do not are not going to engage with you. But what I would say is that often the people who you know don't make that judgment too quickly is is what I would say. Right? Often the people who you think are going to be really aggressive or or unpleasant or dishonest in, in engaging with you um, can be manage in a way that actually brings out the best in them and you can you can if you're skillful you can make that relationship work and therefore make the disagreement productive um so so yes absolutely sometimes what you're learning is that this person cannot be engaged with but actually you shouldn't make up your mind about that too quickly you you should see what you can do to 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 break to make the relationship work before you get into the disagreement. Yeah. Um, in your article, you also mentioned how important it is to uh, arrest people. Right? I mean, being a policeman, you know. And uh, could you talk a bit about that and uh, and uh, how important it is to uh, uh, not humiliate people? And uh, you even said something very striking that. Uh, this is uh, how the revenge is being born, and uh, you know, this is how your uh, colleagues can get killed um, uh, when you're arresting someone and you humiliate this yeah. person. And- I spent time with um, uh, police uh, in the U.S. with the Memphis 
police department who are being trained in de-escalation skills um, mm-hmm. by, a, by a group of very thoughtful, very intelligent ex-cops who, uh, by the way, would be, are as horrified or more horrified perhaps than anyone by some of the abuses that, that, that we see in, in, in the news in terms of uh, uh, the police, the US police at the moment. Um, and the, the more kind of forward thinking and innovative police departments are, are doing this kind of de-escalation and communication uh, training um, to, to, to make sure that these situations don't get into the, 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 the position where uh, abuse or violence becomes more of a, a, a possibility. Um, and one of the things that these guys emphasize is you know in an arrest situation you're arrest, arresting someone in the street you you need to do it in a way that respects the other person's dignity right not j- it's the right thing to do first of all you know it's just the right thing to do um but also just tactically if you like um things are going to go better if you say okay you know get let's get the cuffs on because i don't want to get into a fight with you because uh, you know you could clearly do me some damage. Yeah. What whatever it is, it's like there there might be some kind of, you know, there's always some way of showing that like that that person's dignity, their sense of pride is intact. Um and what these these guys were saying and and the, the cops in the room were nodding, which is you often see people doing exactly the opposite. Like there are some cops who will just go out of their way to humiliate that person, right? To make them feel like you know, like they're very small to make them feel terrible um, when they're arresting them, who really kind of enjoy the exercise of, of dominance. And, you know, not only do, is that wrong, again, but, but also it, it, uh, it backfires in, in a big way. Um, and, yeah, so one of the cops I quote was saying, you know, humiliation ends up well, killing your colleagues. Because some of these guys who who they they get humiliated in an arrest and maybe maybe they go to prison, but then years later they remember it, and they have and they go on a revenge mission and and they they kill any cop they see, um and it's just because you know they were treated so badly, um so you know the way you treat someone it ends up kind of rebounding on you now most of us aren't in these kind of life or death violent situations um but even in the way we treat people just in our kind of like more day-to-day kind of uh civilian uh discourse um we we should be just be careful to 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 make you know treat people in a way that makes them feel good about themselves not just because it's the right thing to do um which it is but also because it's just going to be good for your for, for your relationship um, and it's good, going to be good for the discourse in general. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, what is the role of misunderstanding in conflict? Uh, because uh, sometimes it's just that, right? Sometimes we don't get to the uh, depth of the issue and we think that we disagree uh, before we actually disagree. I was wondering if... Uh, if there is a lot of, uh, you know, misconstructed uh, conflict online that maybe ne- doesn't necessarily even exist there, thoughts? Yeah, and and not just on online, but but generally, you 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 often get we often get into disagreements where both or all the parties um, are not actually clear on what you're disagreeing about. <laughs> you know? Like COVID nineteen. Um, it happens with with COVID, but it happen, can happen on a conversation, you know, in a conversation about your family or or, or at work. He, the 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 kind of the argument takes on a kind of life of its own, and the thing about which you were disagreeing on um, kind of disappears, or or never really was defined in the first place. And sometimes you can be arguing about things where each person has a very different idea of what the argument is 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 over um and so yeah one of the the things i say is is 
try and work out what the disagreement is about and, and try and agree on that first, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just getting that basic agreement of, because okay, so what, what is actually our, our, our point of conflict here? What is the thing that, that, that we're disagreeing about? Let's be clear about that first and then get into the, the argument over it. We, we don't do that w- often enough. Um, now, sometimes it's a disagreement over a kind of empirical matter. Um, and, 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 and so that will direct your argument in one way. Like, you know, what is, what are we disagreeing about the rate at which people die from COVID-19? Is that, is that what we're, is that what we're disagreeing about? Or the effect of lockdowns, whether or not they're effective, is that what we're disagreeing about? Well, that's an empirical matter and we can kind of cite evidence um, in order to, to, to come to a point of view on that. Or are we disagreeing about our values, uh, something, you know, to do with our values? All right. Are we saying that actually, um, I, I value the, um, you know, I, I think we should pay less attention to to the deaths of old people and 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 value more highly uh, the the education of our of our children. I, I I think the latter is is actually much is more important than than the former. Uh, you know, going forward. Okay, fine. That that's an argument you can have because at least you've kind of defined what it's about. It's a difficult one because you know arguments over over values are are, are tough. But at least you kind of, and you've separated it from from the empirical question. So uh, yeah, so um, it, it's it's certainly misunderstanding and yeah, mutual kind of talking past each other is is a big reason that disagreements go wrong. Yeah. So a good productive conflict can potentially uh, lead to a change of mind on one side or both. Uh, and uh, do you remember those spectacular change of minds that, of course, happened to uh, everybody um, uh, towards life? Um, do you remember when you changed your mind spectacularly? I'm laughing because I realize that this is a very unfair question and I'm not sure how I would answer uh, myself. Yeah, I, I mean, I actually, it's funny. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I'm not sure that's the right, the right way to think about it. We, we do often think about it like that. Like, um, mm-hmm. we, we think of a change of mind as this kind of 180 degree turn where you, where you think, well, I was for capital punishment. And then I had this conversation and afterwards I was like, wow, I'm totally against it. That, that person really changed my mind. Um, and and, and when we're in an argument, that's what, sometimes what we we think is going to happen. I, you know, I'm going to make this brilliant argument, and the other person is going to go, "Oh my gosh, you're totally right," I, and I'm completely wrong. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I mean, this is a fantasy. You know, this could pure fantasy. It's it, that's not how it works. Now, it's neither is it true that nobody ever changes their mind about anything. Um, but people change their mind. Kind of gradually, um, and over hmm. time, right? Most of the time, yeah. Um, and so, when you're in an argument o- over something, I don't think you should have the expectation that I'm going to blow this person's mind. They're, they're going to completely agree with me by the end of it. That's not going to happen. The, the best you can do is is offer an alternative perspective on something, and hope that either in the conversation that you're having, or perhaps Three weeks later, when they're reflecting on it, that you modify their view on it, that you've you've actually kind of changed their mind in the sense of just changed it a little, right? Not completely, you know, radically changed their position, but maybe they've changed, maybe they've mm-hmm. got a bit more information, a bit more insight into how other people, or people on the other side of the debate think. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's probably a, a that's true, you know, in terms of that's how people change their mind. But also it's going to make the conversation go better because you're not going to press so hard on your point because you want people to walk away from the conversation thinking, OK, that guy was not a total asshole. <laughs> right? <laughs> because if you are, then they're not going to give what you said any thought. Um, there's a great quote actually from one of the cops who, who said the moment that they that he's talking about suspects or just be criminals or people you're trying to arrest he says the moment that they sense that you dislike them 
is the moment that they feel they can ignore you. And so he said, you know, when hmm. I'm trying to persuade somebody, because I don't want to, I don't want to arrest them. I'm just trying to persuade them to stop doing the thing that they're doing. <laughs> and I'm trying to calm the conversation down. Um, if I do it in a way that that sh- that signals that I dislike them, they're just they're going to stop listening to me, and in fact, they might get aggressive. Um, so uh, you know, signaling to your interlocutor that you like and 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 respect them is is going to make the conversation go better, and it's going to help them change their mind, if only a little bit. Yeah, I just wonder how that would work work with Hitler, you know, in elevator this hype hypothetical situation well, it wouldn't work but again <laughs> i keep saying this but you know i'm not saying that no, everybody know, can be could, could, you know have their mind not everybody can be engaged in a productive disagreement i'm not I, I, that's 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 not my point at all no no i i do i just uh, you know there's so much work uh and there's so much patience we have to give to each other and i was wondering uh so uh time um uh, it's a good thing in conflict, right? Uh, um, uh, it uh, it faci- you know it does uh, you know conflict gets better over time uh, if we will uh, invest in it. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not talking about uh, the conflict that is just being left on its own uh, and uh, just changes into not talking to one another, right? Yeah. I what was your I didn't I didn't understand the question. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. There was no question really. I was wondering uh if time uh, is a good thing uh with conflict should we give ourselves uh time uh, uh when we uh when we are in a con- conflict situation or uh or is it or not necessarily. Yeah, I mean I, I certainly think the value that's... of time, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I, I certainly think that slowing down is often a good way to make the conversation go better. Um, if it's going badly, it, 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 it can be because everybody's speaking too fast and thinking too fast and kind of speaking and thinking very impulsively. Um, this happens on social media because it's just so easy to kind of tap away. Um, but it happens in, in real life. You know, we have these very kind of fast, speedy, emotional arguments and just taking a beat taking a pause just kind of slowing the pace of it down uh can can help so um yes i i, I do think that's a, a a good option to to try um okay um uh i would like to ask you about something that you uh said or rather wrote in 2014 uh, you said, uh, if you do not love Joe Biden, you do not love humanity. And I was wondering, how do you feel about this sentence from a perspective of, well, quite a few years? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I, I'm, I guess I wouldn't put it quite like that uh, right now. But but um, no, I yes. do think that he is somebody who uh, essentially has a, a, a kind of a good... He's a large-souled person. Uh, he's essentially uh, just a, a good guy, you know. Now, it doesn't mean that I think he's going to get everything right or that he's doing everything right politically. Um, but I think if you've ever seen him talking to, for instance, uh, families who have been bereaved, you know, there's 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 a a a, 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 a video of him talking to families of, of um, military, uh, you know, um, people in the military have lost their lives in, in service. And you just see this incredible sense of, uh, of empathy uh, and connection um, that comes from, you know, obviously the, the, the tragedies of his own life, which he has, which haven't made him bitter, haven't kind of shriveled him but have done the opposite. They kind of made him uh, the greater soul and, and, and more empathetic person. Um, yeah, and I, I still, I guess I would stand by that. I'd say, you know, unless you, I, I actually don't think that you could watch that or, or, or watch him in other contexts and, and think, you know, here is a terrible guy. You, you could think he's a, he's a bad politician. He makes bad de- decisions. 
but being being able to separate those two things, I think, is quite important. Yeah. Um, uh, you also uh, said after Thomas Mann that a writer is someone for whom writing is more difficult than it is for other people, which I found uh, very, very uh, beautiful. Uh, could you uh, uh, tell us why you decided on on, on this particular uh, quote and what is writing to you? It's really hard. And, and um, it's the kind of thing that is, is easy in one sense and that anybody, well, if you know if you're if you're literate anybody can can write um sentences and they might and they'll make some kind of vague sense uh and so therefore people think it's you know it's quite easy to kind of write an article or write a book um but then when you try it it turns out it's incredibly hard and it's it's not just hard to write well it's hard to write not badly um yeah so so thomas mann's point was you know, it, it, writers are somebody who their job is to think about writing well, uh, and that so that their their job is to make the act of writing difficult. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's it's a bit of a a, a a cry from the heart. Yeah. So your book, Conflicted, uh, is very very new, uh, but I'm sure you are already thinking about next projects, or maybe not. Maybe you're taking a vacation. Um, what's what's in your mind? What do you think you will be doing next? I I honestly don't know. I I would like to write um, uh, uh, another book, but I um, I'm considering all sorts of different themes at, at the moment. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, well, thank you uh, so, so much for this. Um, this is Cover Story, and we spoke today with Ian Leslie. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed it.